Hi, and welcome to the Sid course. Like discourse, but my name is Sid. The influence of Kentaro Miura's Berserk is far-reaching, an action fantasy set in a European medieval world filled with monsters and political intrigue that has captured a worldwide audience. Having been in circulation for over 30 years, it's a lifetime of work embodied into a single property. You can see the way it's influenced other popular media, from Cloud's relationship with his Buster Sword in Guts and his Dragon Slayer, to Sephiroth's godlike demeanor mirroring Griffith's resolve. Characters like Mikasa from Attack on Titan have been said to be influenced by the likes of Casca. Even the universes of Dark Souls and Bloodborne take clear direction from the brooding world that Guts traverses post-Eclipse. And as far as the influence of Berserk goes, we won't be looking at the things it's influenced. Rather, in this episode of the Sid Course, we'll be taking a deep dive into what influenced this Japanese masterpiece. Like all creative works, Berserk does not exist in a vacuum. It draws influence from other properties and creators, and in turn, embodies and iterates upon that. In the year 2000, Miura was interviewed by Yukari Fujimoto, a writer and professor of gender studies as well as shoujo manga, and said, Violence Jack and Guin Saga are things I was obviously into, and I do think that Guin Saga was the biggest source for this fantasy universe. The atmosphere has just stuck with me, and now I think of it as a standard to measure against. It's quite clear how stories like Violence Jack and Guin Saga influence the style and direction that Miura took for his series. The high contrast ink work and physicality of characters are similar when comparing these two works against Berserk. And even though these are the more obvious references, especially from the perspective of a manga, there are other references that can be found. Consciously or subconsciously, all creators are inspired by stories, visuals, and events. Miura may not directly refer to other works in quotes about his influences, but I'd like to share with you some pre-conscious or subconscious influences he may have had when creating his world. Several years ago, my wife was visiting the Tate Modern Gallery in central London, perusing the works on display when one caught her eye, a painting of a rocky landscape and a hand holding what appeared to be an egg. It was strangely familiar. She recognized it as a painting by Salvador Dali from her time studying fine art and surrealism with Dali being one of the few artists that she admired. But there was another level to that familiarity that she recalled from something entirely different, a manga series that she was fond of, Berserk. The painting in question is titled The Metamorphosis of Narcissus and depicts the ancient Greek poem of a man that was so beautiful and self-obsessed that he would make people fall in love with him only then to show disdain and contempt of them. As a punishment from the gods for his behavior, he came to a pool and fell in love with his own reflection. Unable to embrace the reflection or have the object of his desire, he withered away from the fire of his compassion and became the Narcissus flower. It's a fascinating work of surrealism. Dali instructed viewers to look at the painting with a distant fixedness, whereby the body of Narcissus will slowly become invisible to the viewer. The body slowly becomes a reflection of the limestone hand holding the egg. The Tate display caption of the painting suggests that the image displays a range of emotions by the themes of metamorphosis anxiety, disgust, and desire, all emotions that correlate to the rebirth of one of Berserk's main characters, Griffith. In the story of Berserk, we follow our protagonist, Guts, a lone warrior that travels from one battlefield to another without a sense of belonging or purpose. And then he meets Griffith. After a short battle, Guts is injured and joins Griffith and his merry band of mercenaries. Like many others in the band of the Hawk, Guts has an admiration and love for its leader, whose goal is to have his own kingdom. Equally so, Griffith becomes obsessed with Guts. When Guts joins the band of the Hawk, it brings a change in him. He grows to love and resent Guts, this man who has no dream of his own, just a will to survive. Griffith treats him like an object to own and possess and use for his own cause. Griffith's obsession, in turn, distracts him away from his own goal for just a moment. A friend would not just follow another's dream, a friend would find his own reason to live. A dream, it's something you do for yourself, not for others. Guts, upon learning that Griffith has no respect for those that follow him, chooses to leave the band of the Hawk, 
so that he can grow and become an equal in the eyes of Griffith. And of course, Griffith does not take that decision well. After a short duel, Griffith loses to Guts and his psyche breaks. In turmoil at the loss of his prized possession and the events that follow, show just how Griffith's change is hollow. He quickly forgets Guts' impact on him, and he only sees Guts as a tool to use to his own end. His following actions end up being his own demise. The story of Narcissus is reminiscent of the fall of Griffith. His downfall begins with an act of pride and ego, under the belief that he could take what he wanted, which in turn leads to his capture and year-long imprisonment and torture. Eventually, he's rescued by Guts, Casca, and a small group of others, and they get him to safety. With his tendons cut and tongue cut out, he's unable to walk or speak, and his mercenary army begins to lose faith and hope in him. Witnessing Guts and Casca choose each other instead of his dreams of becoming king, it breaks him. His god complex and narcissism is the spark that starts the eclipse. In the moments before the eclipse, Griffith leaves the camp on a carriage, chasing a ghost of himself in his prime. His own love for himself is what drives him to chase after it. Much like Narcissus and his reflection in the pool, Griffith desperately chases after his own reflection and ends up in the pool of water, lost, unable to speak, and withering away. The God Hand offers Griffith a choice. As the Chosen One, he can choose to sacrifice the soldiers in the Band of the Hawk to complete his destiny, or not. His visions show how close he has come, and his final choice shows how little he cared for the hundreds, if not thousands of soldiers that followed him to the battlefield. He chooses to sacrifice them. And by taking their lives, it paves the way forward for him, and only him. These soldiers loved him, and their deaths came in the most horrifying way. Not in a glorious battle as they would have it, but as chattel. Not in Griffith's service, but at his command as a sacrifice. As his men are being eaten and torn apart by the monsters of the astral world, Guts attempts to get Griffith out of his cocoon and then tries to rescue his friends and Casca. Griffith emerges in a new body and in his first act of power, he forces himself upon the unconscious Casca, whilst Guts is forced to watch the woman he loves be violated. Griffith has a hatred towards Guts and Casca. By forcing himself onto her is an act of dominance over Guts. He never saw Guts as an equal and only a tool to be used at his discretion. Like Narcissus, Griffith only wants to show how he has the power to take what he wants, no matter the human lives it costs. And this is what finalizes his process into realizing his god complex and becoming one of the god hand. Now, he has been reborn as Femto. In the initial story arc of the Golden Age, the art is fairly traditional in the way that it's presented. Its line work is clean and its rendering has incredible depth which gives the audience's introduction to this world a sense of familiarity. Even the European Middle Age setting is one that readers can easily familiarize themselves with when they begin. However, the artistic choices to adopt a more frenzied and surreal style come into play as the Eclipse and God Hand are introduced. It's a purposeful way to use the medium to create a sense of unease with the reader. This panel of the God Hand features an endless series of doorways and stairways. You can see the influence of this lithograph titled Relativity by M.C. Escher. There's normalcy in the way that the members of the God Hand are idyllically presented as they stand in this abnormal world where gravity does not apply. Another panel of note is this one, which is quite clearly inspired by the Garden of Earthly Delights, specifically the Hell Panel by Hieronymus Bosch. This surrealist collage of happenings depicts heaven, earth, and hell from a biblical perspective. This hellish landscape by Miro gives us a visual representation of the state of the world. Miro's artistic influences from surrealist artists is not a happy accident. If we take a look at the origins of surrealism, it makes sense for the narrative of Berserk that the art style adapted as a storytelling device for the series. Surrealism is an art style movement born from the aftermath of Europe at the end of the First World War. As a rejection of the rational way of viewing the world, it was an expression of thoughts and ideas in an abstract, dreamlike way. The pioneering thoughts collided both reality and the unconscious dream world into one. I believe in the future resolution of these two states, dream and reality, which are seemingly so contradictory into a kind of absolute reality, a surreality, if one may so speak. Surrealism is so intertwined within the themes of Berserk. Looking at both Guts and Griffith as two opposing forces, 
we can see very clear parallels. Guts is dark, brooding, even cynical. Someone that is deep-rooted into the reality of the world that he lives in. In contrast, Griffith embodies light, calmness, and a living representation of the dream, where he is constantly reaching for something that should be beyond his grasp, driven by his own vision of becoming king. Initially, their relationship is harmonious. These two forces can be both opposite and work together. However, what happens when an immovable object collides with an unstoppable force? In the case of Berserk, we land in a world that no longer makes rational sense. In this world, is the desiring of mankind controlled by some transcendental entity or law? Is it like the hand of God hovering above? At least it is true that man has no control, even over his own will. Let's turn back to Salvador Dali, whose influence on Muro comes in more ways than the previous painting discussed. Throughout the story of Berserk, there are mentions of Berlitz, which are these egg-shaped objects that hold the key to immense power. They're tied to the destiny of the characters as things that connect the astral and physical worlds. Dali has frequently used eggs as symbols in his art. And like others, he uses it as a visual shorthand for something that brings hope, life, and new beginnings. Notably, both he and his wife hatch from an egg in the 1970 film, a soft self-portrait of Salvador Dali. For Griffith, the behelet is something that he carries for most of his life, a symbol for what gives him the world through rebirth, and ultimately, the death of what was. Listen here, boy. This is the only path that leads to the castle. Those who really want to make it to the castle must either step over the ones who have fallen, or stay here and pave the road for those who have the will to make it. Geopoliticus' child watching the birth of the new man is one of Dali's more famous pieces and depicts a man scrambling out of an egg with a mother and child watching. It's said to represent the change the United States of America would bring at the end of World War II. And we can see that mirrored in Berserk. Post-Eclipse, there is a great change to the world and to a certain extent, Griffith, now named Femto, does bring peace and light to the world after fighting against Ganishka, the warmonger. However, it's a false peace. He has managed to stop the Midlands War that has been going on for many years through his godlike hold on the world. However, the world has changed, but not for the betterment of mankind. Femto is no different to Ganishka in that neither are kings fighting to protect their lands but astral forces, gods, demons fighting for control over the physical world, and their presence in the Midland brings a new horror which the reader witnesses through the eye of guts. Looking back at Geopoliticus, the same could be argued about America and Dali's work. After the Second World War, there was a hope that came from this new US-centric age that was born. However, as we all know, there have been plenty of atrocities that came from it, both inside and outside the country. Through Guts, we see a new front that must be fought in the form of monsters and apostles that have crossed into the fiscal world. Just like America at the end of World War II, we know that the world will never be the same after nuclear armament. A new monster was born. Finally, I want to show you one more painting from Dali. The Faces of War shows a disembodied face in a barren landscape. Inside the eye sockets and mouth are more identical faces. These faces look like they're whining in misery and in pain, much like the Behelet when it's activated or the walls of faces that surround the band of the hawk when the eclipse comes to pass. Symbolically, this is also a representation of Guts' waking nightmare of facing the same identical faces night after night. A barren landscape for a man that has no other choice but to continue fighting. Except now, he does have a purpose. Caring for Casca, and finally putting an end to the friend he once loved. The pained faces of the undead follow him all melding into one. With a swing of his sword, he'll put them out of their misery, but each death only adds to his own misery and turmoil, night after night. Even if we painstakingly piece together something lost, it doesn't mean things will ever go back to how they were. Surrealism was born at a time where revolutionaries wanted to reject the realities of wars that covered the world and instead look into the abstract and fantastical dream worlds. Except, even within these dreamlike concepts, reality creeps in and makes for something unnerving. Muro may have been directly or indirectly inspired by Dali and other works by surrealists, capturing that same prolonged suffering in his own dark, twisted fantasy. A story that captures the realities of friendships, dreams, and the truth of how any ambition, big or small, requires some sacrifice along the way. You're going to be alright. You just stumbled over a stone in the road. It means nothing. Your goal lies far beyond this, doesn't it? 
I'm sure you'll overcome this. You'll walk again. Soon. Thank you for watching. My wife's a huge fan of Berserk and wrote the script for this episode, introducing me to the anime and manga. As my first episode talking about manga, let me know what you thought about it in the comments below. If you like this episode, make sure to leave a rating and share it with someone you think might find interesting. As always, thank you to my patrons for their support. If you'd like to join these wonderful people in helping to make more of these videos, you can support me on Patreon where you'll get exclusive content, like director's commentaries, recommendations, as well as the music I produce for these episodes. You can find me on Twitter and Discord in the comments below, and of course, if you'd like to see more episodes of The Sid Course, please subscribe. Stay sexy.